Well, let me pray for us as we get started here this morning. Um, we will cover um, a lot, but we will also cover not so much. So let me pray and uh, ask the Lord to help us as we are gathered together with our kids and everything else. So, Lord, we love you. Uh, Lord, be only... We only love you because you loved us, and so um, we just ask God for your help today. We ask for your spirit to counsel, correct, convict, encourage where necessary. Um, We can't do this without you, and so if we have one hope today, my prayer um, is that we would be, um, we would know something about you, that you would show us something about yourself so that we may be changed on the inside, uh, that we would worship you in a new or a deeper way. Um, and that our lives would change. Like That's no small ask, and it's not something that I can conjure up or that we can kind of um, uh, create in a song or an environment. That's something your spirit, oh Holy Spirit, that only you can do. And so um, would you use today to um, bring that kind of change in our lives and in our hearts, uh, in the life of our church, in the life of individuals, in the life of our community, anybody else that's dialing in online, Lord, change us. We don't want to come into this place and leave here and there not be a moment where we understood that you were there. So in your power, in your sovereignty, and in your presence, Lord, we rest um, and we ask these things. Lord, would you give us eyes to see? Would you give us ears to hear? Would you give us minds to understand and give us hearts to believe all that you would have us to see about you? We love you and we are grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today's uh, kind of an important day because we start a new series on the Sermon on the Mount that we've called the Gospel of the Kingdom. Now, candidly, I have called this sermon series about 14 different things, so if I accidentally refer to it as the wrong thing, you will know why. Um, But someone asked me earlier, hey, why are the mountains upside down? Um, Well, because when Jesus came on the scene, he he flipped everything upside down. What we were valuing, we should no longer value. And I think that we'll start to see that pretty quickly as we move into the Sermon on the Mount, which if you don't know where that is, that is Matthew 5, 6, and 7, which we will all be familiar with here um, at the end of our time together. Um, I know this. I'm always honored to be able to bring God's Word to you, and so I'm so grateful that you're entrusting the care of your souls and your children to this church and to this elder body and to these people, and I'm so grateful, uh, and I'm, I'm even more grateful when we do it together in person. I know that there are many online that are still staying at home, but um, like conversation after conversation today has been, I'm just really glad that we get to do this in person. And I'm, my prayer is that we don't get to, or that we continue to get to do this and that it doesn't end. And so it's just always my honor to be able to do this, especially as we do it now in person for like, this is a record. I don't know how many weeks this is in a row, but it feels like a record to me, um, or at least in 2020. So um, I'm, uh, yeah, it's just fun. So um, I wonder this, as we kick off this new sermon series, Um, We get closer to the political season. I'm wondering if you're reminded of what I'm reminded in in uh, political years or election years. And that is we are really in a culture war of so many different uh, layers, but certainly a culture war politically. Um, If you notice this, if you watched any of the the conventions, what you probably saw was two ideologies at war. And Usually in political seasons, it's just a a battle of two different philosophies um, on how to kind of be free people. And somehow or another over the years politically, um, particularly maybe the last four years, um, it's not really two um, equally good ideologies. And maybe this is a longstanding thing that somebody else could tell me about. But it's no longer two equally good ideologies or just, you know, there's some mutual respect in those different points of view. Now, it's truly, this is what I see, this is an election of good and evil. Like if you disagree, you're evil. It's no longer you just disagree. It's your evil because you disagree. And of course, depending on your point of view is really um, who gets to be good or evil, right? So if you're, uh, if you're a Republican, you're clearly good and the other people are evil. Or if you're a Democrat, you're clearly good and the other people are evil. Or if you just don't care, then you're clearly good and the people that do care are evil. And I would say that those people that do care are saying that they're good and you're evil. You see how it all just shifts and changes depending on your own individual perspective. But we are in a culture war that goes something like this, at least politically. This is our platform. Here are some stories to kind of back up that platform. And now, if you live this way, a.k.a. vote this way, God will continue to bless America. Have you, have you heard that? Have you seen that? That's what's being fed to us on a pretty regular basis. 
Um, and it's not just political, right? It's in all things these days. And it is this, this platform of good and evil in many ways. But I want to ask you this. What is God blessing us? What does that actually look like? Because I think when politicians say it, it really means safety and prosperity. Like that we would be safe from our enemy, enemies and our, our economy would just boom like crazy. We want, we want riches and we want to be secure. But is that really God's blessing? Is that truly what God has said in his word is how he blesses us? Material wealth and, and safety? See, I think that's the narrative that's kind of just being fed to us, and we're not even aware of it until someone stands on a stage and goes, hey, you're aware of this narrative that's being fed to you? That God blessing you is kind of making it successful and having uh, a safe place to call home? No, the way of Jesus has more beauty and texture than just safety and significance. The way of Jesus, as we'll see through the Sermon on the Mount, is that God is going to invite us into blessing by following his way, by following his truth, and living into a different kingdom. Um, So I, I wonder when I read through the Sermon on the Mount, like what kind of living represents God on the earth? Is it this political ideology, whether you're, you're going blue or red, is it safety and security or is there something else? Is it red, is it blue, or is it white? And you might think, is it white? Yes, is it white? Is the flag that you fly over your soul, over your heart, and over your home, is it the white flag of surrender to the king and his kingdom? Or is it some other color representing something else? See, I think that there's a great invitation through the Sermon on the Mount to pick up that flag of the enjoyment of God's design for humans to flourish inside of his kingdom. Now, I'm going to use that word flourish several times. I'll define it, or I'll at least give you some uh, background as to why I'm using it here in a minute. But that we would enjoy God's design for humans to flourish inside of God's kingdom. The Sermon on the Mount is going to help us flourish inside of God's kingdom, a part of God's Design. And so to help us understand all that, here's what I'm going to do today. And this is going to be a great test of our will because this is going to be more than you've bargained for this morning. But we're going to do it anyways. We're going to read chapters 5, 6, and 7 in Matthew. There's no way to get a better picture. If you've ever studied a book with me before, when we read Jonah or any smaller book, we read the whole book together because we want to see it from beginning to end. We're going to see the full concept of what Jesus is trying to get to us. But before we get there, and as you prepare to either pull up your Bible app or your actual Bible, which they actually still make. I don't know if you knew that. <laughs> they still make those. And so Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is where we're going to be. But as you think about this, I don't want you to think about Democrat or Republic or Republican or Libertarian or whatever you kind of fit yourself into. I want you to go way back, first century religious person. You're either one of two people in Israel. You're either Greco-Roman, which means you are living, trying to live a virtuous life to get the blessing of Zeus, Athena, and many more, or you are Jewish, and you are trying to live the virtuous life by God's law, and you're trying to get the blessing of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. There's really no other person in first century Israel. You're either Greco-Roman or you're Jewish. And if you are Jewish, you are a small minority and a large majority of people that are looking at you going, you're crazy. That's always been uh, the, the place of God's people. A small minority where people are looking at us and going, you're crazy. You, there's no way that, that life actually works like that. But both systems, much like today's political system, adhere to this message. Do these things and God will bless you. If you are here and you adhere to an A plus B equals C faith, that's no faith at all. That's certainty. And it's certainly going to be a disappointment when it comes to Jesus. He doesn't operate that way, and the Sermon on the Mount is going to help us understand that. Because if you're in first century Rome and you're thinking either Greco-Roman, and I've got to be a good virtuous person to appease the gods of Zeus and Athena and many others, or I have to be a good virtuous person to please the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, there's a new teaching that comes on the scene in Matthew 5 through 7. It's this new teaching from this this, this little-known itinerant preacher who is traveling from city to city. And it, this teaching is accompanied by the authority to heal diseases. 
This teaching is accompanied uh, and isn't limited to the educated, to the privileged. It has come to every man, woman, and child and is available to all. It is a teaching that comes from this traveling messenger who the Bible says in Matthew 4, who went throughout Galilee. He, he, he teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. That's what he's preaching, the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. That's, that's the Arab world. His fame spread throughout all of Syria and great crowds followed him from Galilee to the ten cities of the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and even beyond the Jordan. This teaching has come with power and authority from a little known nobody from Nazareth. And it's no wonder that the world is going to get turned upside down because he's doing things that no one thought possible except for God. And I want you to see this. The Sermon on the Mount does not say live this way and God will bless you, but God has a design for human flourishing or blessing and you are invited into it. Now again, I've said the word flourish to describe the kind of life that God has designed for us and, and has outlined for us in the Sermon on the Mount. This comes from uh, a book that I've been reading and it's been influential. Jonathan Pennington, it's called uh, The Sermon on the Mount and Human Flourishing. Um, it's not light reading, but I encourage you to read it. It'll be fun and we can talk about it. Uh, but the basic idea is this, that God has designed this world and our lives to be lived in a certain way which will promote our flourishing. You see, that's the political ideologies, that we will flourish as a country, that God will bless us if we just do X, Y, or Z. And Jesus has come on the scene for our lives as much as he came on the scene for their life. It says, no, no, it doesn't work that way. Instead, God has blessed you. He does have a design for you. If you will just only live into it, then you will flourish. As a human, as a Christian, as a Jesus follower, you will flourish. It's already been granted to you. It's just a matter of whether or not we're going to catch it and live it. So with all that in mind, let's read Matthew 5, 6, and 7. So buckle up. This is about 14 minutes. Not that I've done it and timed it, but that's what we're going to do, okay? I should get water, but I'm not going to do that. Here we go. Matthew 5, verse 1. Thank you, love, appreciate it. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and he, when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And Jesus opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Now you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. But stand it, stand, put on it, but on a stand, and it gives light to all those in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does these and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, you've heard it said that 
to, to, uh, said to those of old that you shall not commit murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are, while you are uh, going to, with him to court. Lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. For truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I, I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out, throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that of your whole body to be, than to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual morality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you've heard that it was said to, to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God, the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, you've heard it, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be done in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and in the street corners that they may, uh, may be seen by others. And truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard by their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 
But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespass. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. No, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now do not lay up for yourselves treasure here on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, that you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? And consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I tell you, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows what you need, that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all, his thi- all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Judge not that you be, that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see that speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, finds, and the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son takes him, asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter, though, by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Are grapes, uh, you will recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and 
do many mighty works in your name. And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Pretty amazing sermon when you think about all the ground that he covered in 14 or so minutes, at least of my reading. Um, Lust, anger, giving, uh, righteousness, uh, who he is, what it means to be blessed or fully flourishing as a human. Pretty remarkable. From a poor carpenter from Nazareth, that, that would, this would be the thing that he would repeat again and again. I truly believe this was the sermon that his disciples heard hundreds of times as he went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom, helping demonstrate what the kingdom actually looks like for his people. Now, it's been said that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is one of the most popular parts of Scripture, and it's also been said that Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is one of the least understood parts of Scripture. So we love it, but we don't quite get it in many ways. So let me first tell you what the Sermon on the Mount isn't, and then I'm going to give us four things that we can kind of pull away from uh, with today. So what it isn't, it is not a list of do's and don'ts so that you can be accepted into God's kingdom. It is not a list of do's and don'ts to somehow become more virtuous so that you would be blessed by God. That is not what the Sermon on the Mount is, although many, and I mean many, if there's one mistake over the history of the church that we have made, it's reading the Sermon on the Mount prescriptively, meaning if you want God's blessing, this is how you live. That's not what the Sermon on the Mount is about. Instead, Instead, it is a statement that God has already blessed his people, and there's a great invitation into the life of blessing, of flourishing inside of God's blessing for us. It's also not a handbook for, like, the ultra-Christians, the super-Christians amongst us. You know who they are, right? The super-Christians? They actually don't exist. There's no such thing. The only super Christian there ever was, and we'll get this out of Matthew 5, 17, where Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill the law. The only super Christian there ever was is Jesus. That's it. And so this is not some, 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 somehow a handbook for super Christians because there's no such thing. And so I say that because let's not give in to the lie that some people practice their faith and some don't. It's a great lie amongst us. That somehow there are some that are practicing and there are some that are not practicing. I I watched a video this week from someone breaking down worship music from someone I respect. And he goes, you know, I grew up in the church, but I'm just not practicing. What Jesus will say at the end of Matthew 7 is that you are not a Christian if you're not practicing. That, That like he's very plain and he's very clear. We just read it, right? If you don't bear fruit, you're cut off. If you don't do the things that God says to do, if we're, not, if we're not actually living like we actually believe these things, the house that we build, the life that we build will come down to a great fall. So I don't want us to get into our minds that there are somehow two categories of Christians, ones that are like super Christians and ones that are like, yeah, I mean, we kind of just do, you know, church every once in a while, that's fine. It was really, to be candid, Christianity doesn't have anything to do with either. It has everything to do with following Jesus and taking on his life as ours. So what is the Sermon on the Mount and why is it helpful? My prayer is that we would ask that question and answer it over many months ahead. We will be in these three chapters for many months ahead. I will warn you of that. 
But as we steadily unpack this series over the many months, my prayer is that we would see this again and again. And this is my best stab at just a one-sentence summary of the Sermon on the Mount. It's not going to come up here because I've revised it 40,000 times. But the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' invitation to his followers to live life by God's ultimate design so that we may learn to flourish. Let me say it again because some of you are writing that down. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' invitation to his followers to live life by God's ultimate design so that we may learn to flourish. So with that in mind, let me take four things. You guys are going to be like, four things? It's already like almost 11. Dude, you don't even know what's about to happen. Rapid fire, four things. Here we go. Are you ready? Four things that I think we need to take away from this overview and introduction on the Sermon on the Mount. And the only thing that I'm going to cover really in the text is, is 1 and 2. Matthew 5, 1 and 2, which say this to remind us because we just read a bunch of stuff. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Now I want you to understand that this is a huge statement about the authority of Jesus. He's not going around and having constantly to move so as to get everybody else's attention so that they'll listen to him. He goes up on a mountain and the disciples come to him. And then Matthew is very specific in what he says in verse 2. Look at what he says. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying three things. Opened his mouth, taught them, saying. This is a verbal discourse to the disciples, and it is as good as God's authority itself. So number one, first thing, Jesus' teaching comes with God's authority. These two verses tell us, give us a picture of the fulfillment of Moses' ministry in Jesus. You remember Moses? Moses went up on the mountain. He ascended the deep, dark mountain, this high mountain of Mount Sinai. And when he got up there, he was the only one allowed up there because it was thunderous and it was dark and it was gloomy, right? And he got up there and it was all scary and the people of God couldn't even touch the mountain. God's presence was only accessible to one person and his name was Moses. He ascended the hill, so to speak, and he brought God's law to a rebellious people. By the way, if you want to know why you should wear masks, you just got, got uh, evidence of it if you didn't see it. But nonetheless, all of you in the splash zone saw it. Um, everybody else, not so much. All right, let's get back to this, right? So, right, Moses ascends the hill, and he goes to an inaccessible God, and he brings God's law to a rebellious people. Jesus, being the true and greater Moses, fulfilling that ministry, goes up and ascends the mountain. And what happens? The disciples join him on that mountain. And he not just brings God's law to people, he fulfills God's law for God's people. Huge, massive difference that we're getting in Jesus' ministry really is a fulfillment as Moses' ministry. But this has always been what God was going to do all along. Jesus is the true and greater Moses. And so he's basically saying this, I bring God's authority with me. Now listen, y'all, the miracles and all the things that we, that we, we look at in the New Testament, you go, man, why, don't, why doesn't that happen now? Because it happened then. And it still does happen now. I want to tell you right now, we prayed today for a miracle to break out with COVID-19 and cancer. Do we not pray that? We prayed that and we believe that with all of our hearts. But why don't we see it as so easily and readily? Because back then, this was a very brand new thing. And it was to establish God's authority and power on the earth through the person of Jesus. Friends, that authority still remains in the person of Jesus. It has been evidenced by by this document. So we look back and we expect similar things, if not the same things, here and now. That's why we pray. That's why these things were written down. Because we have to have the evidence that Jesus came in power. How do we have the evidence? Miracles. How do we have the evidence? He goes up on a mountain and fulfills God's law for us on our behalf. This is God's authority in Jesus, except now instead of being inaccessible, it is now accessible. Instead of being something we could never actually obey, it is now something that someone else obeyed on our behalf. Jesus thus redefines holy living from obeying God's Mosaic law the righteousness of the Pharisees. These guys were, were sinless, y'all. They could do it all. They memorized the first five books of the Bible. I couldn't even memorize 
Matthew 5 through 7, which I tried for about five minutes, and I thought, that's too much work. We'll just read it. These guys were flawless, right? And now all of a sudden, Jesus becomes perfect for those who were imperfect, and he freely gives his perfection to others. Jesus came as the true and greater Moses, fulfilling the law for us, leading us, check this, leading us out of slavery, not of Egypt, but of sin and death and the devil. Because Jesus' authority is God's authority, this teaching is non-negotiable as a Christian. So you can't just go, this is for the super Christians. You know, the ones that fast. Jesus is going to go, when you fast, not if. This should be normal. Not, you know, the ones that give, the ones that are really dedicated. No, no, no. Not if you give, it's when you give. And so he's going to start to just kind of bring this as a non-negotiable for all people that want to live according to God's design and live into his flourishing. Number two. Number one, Jesus, Jesus' teaching comes with God's authority. Number two, the Sermon on the Mount is an invitation. It is an invitation to live in, uh, as a follower of Jesus in God's kingdom. The New Testament, y'all, was written to believers of Jesus, followers of this Jesus of Nazareth, who was the king, who was Messiah, who was God in the flesh. Nothing else, nothing else will do. So you can either believe that, that he can fulfill God's law for us, or you'll start to doubt it and you'll wonder if he really was who he says he was. God has a design for us, again, for human flourishing, and we are invited into it by living this way. And so to steal a line from the Mandalorian, the Sermon on the Mount is, this is the way. Is that not the line? That's the line, right? I haven't seen it in a while. This is the way. Absolutely. So, um, I'll, I'll bring it like this. Okay, so everybody wants land these days. Have you noticed this discussion? Um, like before COVID broke out, I had multiple discussions with many of us in our church. Like, oh, I'm just saving up for land. Just saving up for land. That used to be an old man's thing to do, like to save up for land or an old person's thing to do is go save up for land and go retire to the country. But somehow it's trickled down into the 20s and 30s of Fort Bend County. And we're just going to save up for land in Fulcher, which we can't afford. So we're going to go try and go to Needville, which we really don't want to go to, but I guess it'll do. Sorry to anybody that lives in Needville. Um, it's just far, man. That's all. It's great. It's beautiful. It's just far. But this is like kind of our thing, right? So I just want you to imagine that someone gave you 100 acres in whatever little part of the world you think you want to live in. Maybe it's Concan. Mm. Hey. Maybe it's somewhere else. You got 100 acres and somebody just gave you 100 acres. But the problem is, is that you have my background. You grew up at Westheimer and Derry Ashford. And so you know how to catch a bus. You know how to look tough. You know how to walk downtown with your head on a swivel, and you know how to teach your kids to do the same when you're walking out of an Astros game. You don't just look straight ahead and look for your car. You walk with your head on a swivel. You learn how to get street smart. You know how to learn how to survive in those environments. You have no idea how to take care of cows. And I raised a hog. Still don't know how to do it. I don't know how to take care of cows or chicken or crops. Like the, the, the fence needs mending. I'm calling somebody else. Where's my, where's my guy that can do that? The problem is this. This is a great illustration, I think, for us, right? I can catch a bus. I can avoid potholes. I can do a lot of things. But I have no idea how to live in that kingdom of 100 acres in whatever part of the world I want to live in. Though it's been gifted to me, though the blessing has already landed on my life, I have no idea how to live there. The Sermon on the Mount is exactly that. The, the God of the universe has given you the kingdom, which is, which is truly uh, uh, authored and really the authority there being the gospel. We have no idea how to live there. We have no idea how to flourish in that environment and so the Sermon on the Mount is going to help us flourish in this new place. It's an invitation to live as a follower of Jesus in that place. Third, rapid fire, I'm telling you, Sermon on the Mount is a mirror. It will serve as a mirror. And what will you properly see with that mirror? You will see yourself accurately, and more importantly, you will see God accurately. So righteousness is a big theme in the Sermon on the Mount, and you will be constantly brought to the end of yourselves and to the end of your abilities. When you read passages like we just read 
And it says, um, you shall not uh, murder. You've heard it said of old, you shall not murder. But I tell you that if you've been angry with your brother, you've already, you're already guilty of murder. And you think to yourself, that can't be true. Let me read that again. He says it three different times, three different ways. If you say, you fool, okay, well, I've definitely said that. If I haven't said it, I've definitely thought it. Man, I'm liable to the fires of hell. Okay, that will lead us, if, I mean, again, with the whole lust issue. I, I tell you that if you don't commit adultery, but if you've looked with your eyes, and it says woman, but we can extrapolate that out to say man too, a woman or a man, if you look at them lustfully, then you've already committed adultery with them in your heart, to which we all will sink into one of two places, deep despair or deeper trust. See, we will come to the end of ourselves with the Sermon on the Mount that we cannot do this. We need someone greater to fulfill the law for us, and Jesus says, I'm the guy. See, that's the beauty of the sermon. It's not about you do things and I'll get God's blessing. It's I'm blessing you. I have blessed you. Live as a result. Right? This is the, the, the whole desire for God for us is to understand, number one, we have no righteousness of our own. And so, friends, we need to reevaluate where we get our rightness from. If you think it's based on your performance, on your goodness, um, on your consistency, uh, from others, your acceptance, how well you do, how, how, how praised you are at work, or whatever it may be, we're in deep trouble. Because if your righteousness is based on you, and dare I say, it is, because my righteousness on many days is based on me and my performance. And I know it seeps in. Even though we know the truth, lies seep in each and every day, each and every week, to tell us that we're basing our righteousness on our own. And the way that we know that is when things don't go our way, we get angry or upset and that's how we know. I've based my righteousness on something else besides Christ. And when we become prideful, it's the opposite, by the way, of meek. When he says, blessed are the meek, we become prideful, right? We become self-reliant, which is the opposite of being poor in spirit. That's what happens when we start to get self-righteous. But instead, if your righteousness is based on someone else's performance, if your righteousness is based on someone else's rightness and that person gifts that rightness to you and he gives it to you only because he wants to, not because you deserve it, just because he wants to, that's how good he is, then the only response is gratitude, isn't it? Isn't the proper response not pressure and duty and I got to do this? It's instead, God's done all these things for us, and I have deep gratitude and humility and a desire to please that he who gave me this gift. Finally, fourth, the Sermon on the Mount will call us to the unpopular road of obedience. Christians are called to love God through doing what God wants us to do, through living like God wants us to to live. We integrate every decision into the kingdom. We integrate every decision and we filter every decision through the filter of the gospel and of Jesus. And so what do we do with our time? What do we do with our money? What do we do with our emotions? And where do we get pleasure? All those things are now being really just re-filtered through Jesus's definition and guidance on how we live this way. Everything goes through what he says, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus' method of preaching I find to be very different than what we find in most churches today. Most churches today, we want to end on a high note. We don't want to end them like, you know, kind of depressed. We want to keep them smiling, so to speak. And Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount by saying, you're going to go to hell if you don't do this. You think you know me, but you really don't. And if you don't do these things, your whole life is going to crumble. Amen. <laughs> we'll see you next week. Right? Jesus' way of doing things is so countercultural back then as much as it is for us today. But instead, he doesn't want to paint a picture for us to have a better life. He instead wants to invite us into the life that he has granted, the full life. Uh, he paints a picture for us of the way God wanted us to live. And then he invites us to forsake all other things. Beliefs. He holds a mirror up to our lives and invites us to live like he would want us to live with the values of the kingdom of God. 
And the only way that we can do that is to give up the prioritization of comfort, of acceptance, or even feeling good or being happy. Because one of the ways that, that blessed is, is translated is happy are those who. And that's, that's fine. It's just a little bit more emotive uh, or emotional um, than what I think Jesus is intending. Instead, it's flourishing, full flourishing, thriving are those who. We'll talk about the Beatitudes uh, next week, but just as a preview, right? But true happiness, true flourishing is found in obedience to God. So there's a great lie. If there's one lie before about super Christians and regular Christians, there's also another lie that says this, simply affirm God. Be a cultural Christian. If people ask you if you're a Christian, you say absolutely. And then if they get a little bit closer to you, what does that look like? If they come and hang out with you, if they go to the playground or the park or follow you at work or at home with you, are your kids scared of you? Those are the types of things that we look back on and go, am I representing God on the earth or am I building my own kingdom? See, there's this great lie, again, that we will just simply affirm the faith, say a prayer, get baptized, do these things, and you'll be fine. But Jesus does not want us to be fine. Like, truly, Lord, help us if our desire is to just be fine. He wants us to understand that no one is fine. Not even the Pharisees. Not even the holiest of the holy of the day. We need someone else to be what we cannot be. Fine was never the goal for us anyways. Instead, he wants us again, you're going to be so sick of this word, to flourish. So how do we do that? How do we actually flourish? See, that's the subject of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount. How do we live inside of this kingdom? How do we live inside of this ultimate God's design for our lives? It's exactly what we're going to discover um, over and over and over again over these next weeks in the Sermon on the Mount as we see God's design for our flourishing and we dig into what we now are calling the gospel of the kingdom. So my prayer is that you would join us, not just on a day, but daily living, kind of digging into what Matthew 5, 6, and 7 truly say. Next week, we're going to tackle the Beatitudes. So verses 3 through 12. If you want to just start digging on that on your own, praise God, you will learn much. And you will come ready and, fill, and filled to figure out if I've missed something. And if I have, which I will, you can tell me about it. It'll be great. What a, what a dialogue and a discourse that would be. And a great Great, uh, unbelievable um, use of your time this week. So having said that, this is the kingdom that God has come to give us. And we celebrate that kingdom through communion. Uh, we don't do it every week, but we do uh, do it today uh, as a church family. And so as Chris comes up and, um, and Sandy as well, they're going to sing over us. And as they sing over us in response, we're going to get our elements, right? Um, our, our little uh, pre-manufactured elements of Jesus. Um, but we're going to take that in faith, right? And we're going to remember, it's going to be a great symbol and, and reminder um, of Jesus' sacrifice for us. So as they're handing those out, I want to do one or, two, one or two things. Number one, we're going we're to sing together as they're handing them out. But number two, um, I want you to like, as parents, we should parent our kids. We should shepherd them in some ways. If they're not ready, it's okay to hold them out. If they are ready, please invite them to the table. But this is a great picture of God's blessing for us. And although we kind of do it with just a little bitty cracker and a little bit of juice or wine, um, really it's a symbol of the great feast of the wedding banquet of God that, 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 that God has prepared for us and for his people in all of eternity. It's this great picture, not just of the future, though. It's a great reminder of the past, that in order to be able to enjoy that wedding banquet, we first have to be able to know our, our true bridegroom who is coming for us. And so that's what this is a good reminder of, that, that that man, Jesus, God in the flesh, has come for us to be our righteousness, to fulfill the law, and to graciously give his goodness to us. We have no good, goodness to offer of our own. If you're, you're here and you're new and you've not heard the gospel this week, let me remind, her, remind you, you have no goodness to offer God. Instead, God offers himself 
to be good on your behalf if you would only believe in Jesus, if you would only believe in his perfect sacrifice on the cross, believe that he rose from the dead, believe that he has ascended and now sits at the right hand of the Father where he reigns and rules over every little thing in our life, both terrible and terrific. He reigns. We believe these things. Will we follow him in these things? And will we dedicate our lives to living the life he lived? That's the goal. That's the hope. So let's sing this together as we get prepared to remember the elements and remember Jesus' death for us.